Earlier this year, fans of the PBS mega hit series, Downton Abbey, viewed its finale and lamented the end of the elegant dinners at the estate of the Earl and Countess of Grantham. Such grandeur and entertaining wasn't limited to peers of the realm, however. Across the pond, during America's Gilded Age, wealthy St. Louis families greeted relatives, friends, and guests with similar flourish. That's what I discovered during a visit to the historic Campbell House. General, Julia, so kind of you to come tonight. That's food historian Suzanne Corbett on the left as the 19th century matriarch of one of the wealthiest families in St. Louis, Virginia Campbell. She's greeting President Ulysses S. Grant, who preferred being addressed by his former title of general, and First Lady Julia Dent Grant on the right. Socialite and philanthropist Virginia Campbell welcomed the rich and powerful to her home, where she often threw lavish receptions and dinner parties. Her husband, Robert Campbell, began in the mercantile trade, was a successful fur trader, and expanded his holdings to railroads, gold mines, and other diverse interests. As part of the 1% of their era, living in the fashionable Lucas Place neighborhood, the Campbell's fortune was evident throughout their home, including the dining room, which still holds the original china, crystal, and silver, and the kitchen, where Campbell House cooks created memorable meals. With the exception of the stove, which is a reproduction, everything from the canisters to the cookware is original too. It's the food that inspired Suzanne Corbett's book, The Gilded Table, Recipes and Table History from the Campbell House. Corbett drew mostly from Virginia's extensive collection of handwritten recipes. So did you test all these out yourself? All of them, yes. Out of the 224 recipes, there were 176 that made it into the book, of which 142 were of Virginia's own hand. So we had to decide how they were put together. So I spent three and a half years researching, looking at the different recipes, trying to decide how far back a particular recipe could be documented, how it changed, how it was similar to what Virginia wrote. And this is a time frame much much like today, that there's an assumption that you know how to do something. You would know how to punch a button on a microwave today. It was assumed that you would know how to regulate a stove or regulate a fire. These rolls are called Sally Lund rolls. The recipe from Corbett's book can also be used to make traditional loaves of bread. Corbett gave us a demonstration in the Campbell House kitchen. I have a little bit of yeast in here. Now in Virginia's day, you could buy commercial yeast, believe it or not, but you could also make your own. We're using commercial yeast today because it's easy. So I have a little bit of flour. I'm gonna add just a little bit of sweetener to this. Just a little bit. I'm using about, oh, about a quarter cup or so. Then I'm gonna add three eggs. It's a very rich dough. Very, very rich dough. And we can also add a little bit of shortening to this. And shortening in Virginia's day was not the hydrogenated vegetable oil that you have today, or that actually what you're getting away from now. I'm gonna stir this in. And like any good bread, you're gonna make it enriched a little bit more with some milk. Now I'm using a half and half just because it would be more of the quality of milk back in the day. I'm gonna bake it in this muffin pan, and this is an original muffin pan of the era. Back in the Campbell's day, spices were essential to pleasing the 19th century palate. Cinnamon, mace, nutmeg, you saw that pop up in more things than just sweets and desserts, pastries and such. You'd find them in soup stews and in and in savory pieces of meat. And speaking of meat, on that platter is beef chasseur, sauteed medallions in a brandied mushroom sauce. 
It was a popular menu item at the Southern Hotel, which was owned by Robert Campbell and was widely considered the finest hotel west of the Mississippi. A number of dishes from the hotel's kitchen are included in the gilded table. It's a pretty picture book and it's got a lot of wonderful history, but it's also a book that you can taste the past from. You can taste those snowballs, which were apples baked with wonderful spices encased in rice and then served with a vanilla cream sauce. Or you could take a very simple recipe just like fried chicken or chicken fricassee and make that as well. Gilded Age dining was a la russe or Russian style, meaning dinners could include a dozen separate courses or more. You weren't expected to eat everything. It was okay to wave people on. You might taste a few things and move on. And of course, halfway through the meal, you'd have Roman punch served, which was a fanciful dish, and it's become the signature recipe from decades here at the Campbell House, which is best described as a sparkling wine champagne style slushy. It's lemon and orange and it's citrus base and it's really a delightful palate cleanser. But at the time it was thought that if you would take a little bit of citrus, orange or lemon, in the middle of one of these meals, it would allow you to have more room in your stomach so you could enjoy the rest of the courses that followed. Courses like duckling with olives. The original recipe was traced back to French cookbooks from the early to mid 1800s. Rissoles, which are similar to croquettes, but instead of rolling them in crumbs, they're wrapped in pastry before frying. Grilled mutton chops, or as they are more commonly known, lamb chops. The recipe calls for French cut or loin chops. And there are baked oysters seasoned with breadcrumbs, salt, pepper, and mace. Suzanne Corbett says oysters were plentiful and inexpensive during the 19th century, but fell out of favor in the 20th due to supply and demand. The, the oyster beds were, were over harvested and they became more dear. But because they were plentiful, you could fancify them up. You could use them in fricassees, you could use them baked in pickled, you could use them, oh, a variety of different soups and stews. There were five recipes for different oyster dishes in Virginia's collection. Now one of the things that was a rarity that became cheaper that uh, I've always thought was kind of fun was celery. Celery was very costly. It was expensive to make, it, uh, it was expensive to produce, I should say, and it was a status thing to have on your table, much like if you wanted to impress somebody today, you might go out and grab some lobster or some beautiful prime steaks. You would go out and grab yourself some celery and decoratively put it in your celery vase to display it, to let everybody know, look what I have for you. I think so much of you that I have celery. Years ago, Corbett had an office down the street from the Campbell House, and one day she went up and knocked on the door. When the curator at the time welcomed her in, Corbett entered an era that has enriched her work as a food historian ever since. And my jaw dropped on oh, this beautiful Gilded Age mansion is just, is as breathtaking then it is, as it is now. But when he took me into the dining room, that's when I fell in love.